Shalom from Israel. I'm Shira Sokoram reporting to you from Tel Aviv, and I want to welcome you to Israel Frontline, your guide to Israel and the Middle East. Today we begin a four-part series on Islam. We will explore in depth various aspects of this religion, focus on its publicly declared goals, and acquaint you with the Muslim Brotherhood and its strategy in the United States. We will begin with a discussion on whether Islam is a religion of peace as many proclaim. On the program today, how do world leaders and mainstream media describe Islam? What are the basic elements of Islam? Finally, our panel will join me to discuss Islam and its publicly declared objectives. The eloquence of world leaders describing Islam is voluminous. President Barack Obama announced at the UN, we have reaffirmed again and again that the United States is not and never will be at war with Islam. Islam teaches peace. Former President George W. Bush avowed, I believe that Islam is a great religion that preaches peace. The face of terror is not the true faith of Islam. That's not what Islam is all about. Islam is peace. These terrorists don't represent peace. They represent evil and war. British Prime Minister David Cameron said, there is nothing in Islam that justifies acts of terror. Pope Francis agreed. Islam is a religion of peace, one which is compatible with respect for human rights and peaceful coexistence. The British magazine, The Spectator, cynically summed it all up. In France, Britain, Germany, America, and nearly every other country in the world, it remains government policy to say that any and all attacks carried out in the name of Muhammad have nothing to do with Islam. It was said by George W. Bush after 9-11, Tony Blair after 7-7, and Australian Prime Minister Tony Abbott after the Sydney attack. It is what David Cameron said after two British extremists cut off the head of drummer Lee Rigby in London. When Jihadi John cut off the head of an aid worker, Alan Henning, in the Islamic State, and when Islamic extremists attacked a Kenyan mall, separated the Muslims from the Christians, and shot the latter in the head. And of course, it is what President Francois Hollande said after the massacre of journalists and Jews in Paris. The Spectator goes on to say, we have spent 15 years pretending things about Islam. It is true that most Muslims live their lives peacefully. But a sizable portion, around 15% and more in most surveys, follow a far more radical version. What is new is that there is now an ongoing mass immigration of Muslims to the West at the same time as a worldwide return to historical Islamic literalism. Islam is now a problem for all of us. The Spectator magazine declares, to stand even a chance of dealing with it, we are going to have to wake up to it and acknowledge it for what it is. So where does this leave Christians and Messianic Jews? What are we to do? It would seem sensible that the first question be, where in the world did these leaders get their Islamic intelligence coaching? But that question presents us with necessity, even the responsibility, to obtain for ourselves at least a rudimentary understanding of the basic elements of Islam, that which was produced by Muhammad himself and his close associates. 
Even though this will be anything but a deep study of Islam, what you are about to hear has seemingly not found its way into the hands of these world leaders. The religion of Islam is based on three texts. The Quran, which contains the words of Allah as revealed by an angel who introduced himself to Muhammad as Gabriel. It is divided into 114 surahs or chapters. Secondly, the Sirah, which is the biography of Muhammad, was written by his early followers and accepted by virtually all Muslims as divinely inspired. Thirdly, the Hadith is a collection of short stories and traditions about Muhammad and his followers. If something is not supported by these three texts, the Quran, the Sirah, and the Hadith, then it is not Islam. Now here is a very important point that is absolutely essential to understanding the message of the Quran. The earliest revelations received by Muhammad from around 610 AD when he lived in Mecca were conciliatory and peaceful. For example, there are verses such as, for you is your religion and for me is my religion. At that time, he was a poor preacher surrounded by doubting and often angry unbelievers. In fact, after 13 years of preaching and persuading, he had only 150 converts. However, when he fled to Medina in 623 AD, he quickly gained converts and his power base began to grow exponentially. The larger the number of followers, the more combative he became in proclaiming Islam as the only true religion and demanding that all tribes in Arabia submit to Allah or be killed. Here's a classic verse from the latter period that is used by all militant Muslim groups. Kill the polytheists, meaning pagans, wherever you find them and capture them and besiege them and sit in wait for them at every place of ambush. But if they should repent, meaning become Muslims, establish prayer and give alms, let them go on their way. Even though the chapters of the Quran were rearranged by Muhammad's followers after his death, with early and later revelations completely mixed up, still the average Muslim student today can clearly discern that the early Quranic passages written in Mecca are very different from the later passages written in Medina. But now a new challenge arises. What about all the conflicting verses? In Mecca, Allah says one thing. In Medina, He said the opposite. The answer brings us to the subject of abrogation. Abrogation is the concept that Allah chose to reveal verses in the Quran that supersede earlier revelation in the same Quran. As Islamic scholars see it, a later verse can nullify or negate a previous verse. The doctrine of abrogation is widely accepted throughout the Islamic world. It is based on passages in the Quran like this one. We, meaning Allah, do not abrogate a verse or cause it to be forgotten except that we bring forth one better than it or similar to it. Do you not know that Allah is over all things competent? In other words, it's not so much that Allah negates His commandments, rather He improves on them. Here's an example of two conflicting verses in the Quran. Allah is our Lord and your Lord. For us, 
is the responsibility for our deeds and for you for your deeds. There is no contention between us and you. Allah will bring us together and to Him is our final goal. Now, here comes the later revelation that abrogates or improves the former revelation. Fight, meaning kill, those who do not believe in Allah or in the last day and who do not consider unlawful what Allah and His Messenger, meaning Muhammad, have made unlawful, and who do not adopt the religion of truth from those who were given the scripture, meaning Jews and Christians, fight until they give the jizya willingly while they are humbled. The jizya is the tax Jews or Christians who refuse to convert to Islam can pay to save themselves from death if they have the money. Otherwise, they are murdered. All pagans or infidels of other religions or no religion who will not convert to Islam are to be killed, period. This verse is another one of the main verses used by modern day jihadists. In summary, there is no other conclusion except to acknowledge that the overwhelming evidence shouts that systemic murder is the big difference between Islam and all other religions. Islam is a stronghold, holding 1.6 billion people hostage. Islam has already claimed an immeasurable number of souls for its kingdom. We have the power to pray and beseech the God of Israel to break this stronghold and to set his creation free. We must also pray for help for the Middle East Christians. They are under extreme pressure to keep themselves below the radar in order to survive. And many, if not most, are afraid for their lives to do any evangelizing among Muslims but we know there must be a world-shaking revival in the Muslim world since the prophet Joel foretold that the spirit of the God of Israel will be poured out upon all flesh. I'll be right back with our panel of guests to explore deeper the characteristics of Islam. The Maoz Israel Report is a free monthly publication of Maoz Israel Ministries. Published online in eight different languages, it will give you a fresh spiritual and prophetic perspective on the political and social current events in Israel as they happen. The Maoz Israel Report is news you can believe. Subscribe today at maozisrael.org slash sign up and get the insider's perspective of the way things really are in Israel. Welcome back to Israel Frontline. Joining me in the studio are Mati Shoshani, Director of Operations for TBN Israel from Jerusalem, and Yosef Haddad, an Israeli Christian Arab pastor from Northern Israel. Thank you for being here today with me. Mati, there is no more violent religion in the world today than Islam. And there are more people, more leaders in the world that are saying Islam is a peaceful religion. What is the cause behind this paradox? First, let's be honest, there are many peaceful Muslims. So that has, that has to be said. However, many of the extremists or the religious Muslims are violent. And what can be said is, you know, on a very basic PR level, you know, public relations, media work, that Islam has done an incredible job of getting this message across of we're, we're peaceful, we're the religion of peace, and so on and so forth. And you'll see there's a theme to this religion, which is that it's not the same when they're a minority or a majority. And I'll explain that. When, the, when Islam is the governing religion, they're a religion of violence, of oppression, of you know, anything bad you could find in a religion. And when they're a minority, suddenly the message changes and they talk about, no, we have to be patient and uh, you know, accommodating to other religions and other mindsets and so on and so forth. So they sort of spin the whole thing 
right. to make to make it give right. that appearance. Yosef, what do you uh, add to this? Well, I believe it's a spiritual blindness. Um, the people don't see with their spiritual eyes because they don't have a spiritual eyes. So they look with their natural eyes and they see Islam as a peaceful religion, as a, a religion that can cope with. But uh, the truth is this religion has a agenda. They have a, uh, they have a charter. They have a goal to conquer the whole world. So but here, here it is that everywhere across the globe, Islam is violent. So you're saying that people don't see it. They're blind. Uh, it, how can they be blind to something that is that um, uh, you, clear? Unfortunately, people cannot see that. They need spiritual eyes to be able to discern this spirit. It's a spiritual war. So all the, the Western governments today are, you know, for the most part, they're secular governments. Right. They don't talk in religious terms. They don't talk in faith terms. And here you have you know, holy religious, holy faith-based movements, and they go back, you know, they're, they're talking in seventh century terms. Uh, mm -hmm. Religious war, holy war, holy sites, you know, all these, these different things. And you sort of have this, this gap between the two of them. One is saying, you know, we're human rights, and, you know, everyone is right, and this is like this Western mindset. And on the other hand, you have people who are, you know, wholly committed to a religious concept, and it's hard for these people who are 100% politically correct to relate mm -hmm. to this you know, mm -hmm. strong religious movement right. and not feel like they're being racist right. or biased against and them. And yet, uh, the polls show, um, regular polls, not, not religious polls, just show that 15% of the Muslim population uh, identify with radical Islam. So that would mean there's 240 million Muslims with radical ideas. And what is true, what is everybody can know if they want to, is that Christians are mostly persecuted mm -hmm. in Arab countries, except for Northern uh, Korea. Everything else uh, where you see problems with uh, persecution of Christians, it's usually in a Muslim country. Why don't the Governments see that. They don't say anything about it. The U.S. government doesn't say anything that well, I've heard. Well, you're assuming that they, they don't see it, but I think they do. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think there's an information gap. So they it. don't care? What's they the don't problem? care or the interests don't sort of align with the idea of, of stopping them. You need to understand that you know, for, for a government to make a decision, go on military action or spend money on something or, or you know, use diplomatic pressure, there are several interests that have to align. We're talking uh, diplomatic relations, financial relations. Just an example, you know, there's a term petrodollars. A lot of the oil that goes to the U.S. and other Western countries come f comes from non-democratic, in many cases, Muslim countries. Mm -hmm. So when you start mm -hmm. speaking against them, you, you have this, uh, you know, relationship and tension between the, the financial side and the religious side. And historically speaking, the West is slow to act when it's just a Christian minority in some Arab country. Mm -hmm. that, that's just the truth of it. Mm -hmm. It takes more than that. It takes a financial interest or you know, huge public pressure to really do something more than just say, oh, we condemn violence against religious minorities. Right. Do you think that many leaders uh, in the democratic world are afraid to say anything about the violence uh, that is inherent in violent Islam do you think it's because they themselves are afraid to say anything? Well, some, some governments actually have reason to be afraid. If you look at European countries, specifically Scandinavian ones, mm -hmm. France, they, they suffer from a serious threat of the Muslim, pop Muslim population in their countries. And they can't just go out and say, and you, we've seen you know, riots and demonstrations and uh, acts of terrorism in those countries. They're genuinely afraid to speak against the Muslim population. Because the, the response is, and it sounds like a joke, but this is for real. You say Islam is a, is a dangerous religion. They say, how dare you say we're dangerous? We'll kill you all. Exactly. That, that is the automatic response every single mm -hmm. time someone mm -hmm. says it. So they have reason and they are afraid of the Muslim population in their country. But there's another thing which really goes back to the sort of the faith issue. They have trouble reconciling with this idea that someone could be so zealous to their faith. They're just, you know, again, they're humanistic, they're secular governments, and the notion that some, a group of people could be so violent, you know, so obsessive with an idea because of their faith is, is almost foreign to these governments. Right. So they don't really know how to deal with it. It's, it's a bigger problem. Right. Yosef, 
When Christians want to talk to Muslims about the true faith, mm -hmm. the God of Israel, the God of the Bible, what is it that makes it so difficult for Christians to be able to get through to uh, a Muslim person? Uh, well, uh, I believe that uh, it's a, again, it's a spiritual matter. I like to look at uh, things from a heavenly perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, they are caught up in a false religion, unfortunately. They are in a spiritual prison. Actually, the Muslims are uh, victims of a false religion. And I think God, God is exposing Islam right now. I, I believe since 9-11, God started to expose the true face of Islam. And uh, when you talk to a Muslim about uh, salvation, about Yeshua, about everlasting life through Yeshua, he cannot understand it uh, with his natural mind. It takes a divine revelation for a Muslim uh, to get to know Yeshua as his Savior and Lord and Messiah. So the, uh, the idea that God is a loving God, mm -hmm. that's foreign to Islam, right. is it not? Yes, definitely, yes. Uh, and there is a reason for that. It goes back to 4,000 years ago when Abraham uh, kicked out Ishmael from the house when Sarah said to Abraham, uh, mm -hmm. drive out the slave and her son. They will not inherit with my son Isaac. So I want to draw your attention that uh, Ishmael lost his fatherhood, the fatherhood of Abraham mm -hmm. as a little child. And, Interesting. and uh, the concept of God as a loving father for Muslims is totally strange. And it's not in the Quran, right? It's it doesn't not, say it's that It's not God there is for the them. God is a just judge mm -hmm. who's uh, holding a sword and ready to punish them for right. every mistake. So right. understanding God yeah. as a... Loving Heavenly Father, th yeah. this demands a divine revelation. Mati, should Christians in democratic countries warn their fellow citizens about the violence in Islam, or could that stir up hatred towards the Muslim people? Well, I think it, I mean, it should be done, and it should be done in a wise manner. Uh, definitely Christianity has a place, where, let's put it this way, not just the religion, anyone who's a disciple of Christ should be called to influence society in a positive way. And if you have information, clearly, you know, the, the knowledge that something bad is happening, you know, Christians are being persecuted, but more than that, people are living under oppression and darkness. You should do everything in your power to stop that. And if that means influencing your government to start dealing with meaningful issues rather than just trivial local politics or whatever it is, you know, that, that is something you should do. So definitely they should do that. And I think historically speaking, Christianity in various governments has had a very, very large part in promoting positive thinking, you know, human rights and all these things that then now are sort of the foundation of our modern government. So definitely they should, they should do those things. So I, I feel that if we can say Islam is a very dangerous religion to Muslims and to the world, but that God loves the Muslim people. He has a heart to see the Muslim people definitely. come to faith. So that is, that is the challenge that believers around the world have. And there are many, many Muslims coming to faith Amen. in spite of all the problems. Are you aware in our neighborhood, in uh, the West Bank, in uh, Israel, of Arabs um, who are Muslims, former Muslims coming to faith? Uh, yeah, there is a powerful tool which is called the internet and the uh, media and the satellite TV, and there are at least 20 Christian stations who are uh, broadcasting or airing 24-7 for Muslim countries, at least 20. And we hear good reports. We hear that hundreds of Muslims and thousands of Muslims are receiving Yeshua, Jesus, as their Lord and Savior through the media. It's powerful. God is doing a wonderful job through the media. So you see... God is still on the throne, <laughs> and Definitely. we are going to see many, many Muslim people throw away the chains that, um, that Islam has, has put around them, and they're going to come out free people and knowing the true one God, Amen. the God of Israel. That's all the time we have for today's Israel Frontline. 
Thank you for watching. I hope you have found this program informative and that you will encourage your friends to tune in as we discuss this important subject. For more information concerning the fundamentals of the Islamic religion and what you can do to help prevent its continuing spread in America, order my new book, The Secret Radical Islamic Plot to Conquer America. Together with a DVD of this series of four episodes on Islam as Muhammad taught it. I also encourage you to sign up to receive our free ma monthly Ma'oz Israel report straight from Israel. In it, I write about events happening in Israel and the Middle East from an Israeli Messianic Jewish point of view. My purpose is to keep Christians and Messianic Jews abreast of what is really happening, news you will not see or hear in the mainstream media. Remember to join us next week for the second in these four-part series about Islam. I will talk about the phenomenon of young successful Muslims turning to radical Islam, examining what exactly draws them to jihad. On behalf of our team and myself, blessings and Shalom from Tel Aviv. A good book can make a real difference in a believer's life. The goal of Maoz Hebrew Books Division is to bring great faith books to Israeli readers in their language. We translate, edit, typeset, and print these books in Hebrew, and then make them available in congregations across Israel. The Bible is full of promises to the Jewish people, promises of physical and spiritual restoration. But how do these promises relate to today's reality in Israel and the Middle East? In addition to the Israeli side of the story, the Ma'oz Israel Report ties in the biblical perspective with what is happening in the region. Subscribe to receive this free publication at maozisrael.org slash sign up. We will also send you the digital version of Ari's book, To the Jew First, when you sign up.